Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well in this time. Uh, really nice day out here in New Mexico. Uh, I'm Omar, and with me is Marshall, as always. So um, last time we discussed uh, ACC football history, uh, whether the conference is, has ever been a football conference, and we talked about what it takes to win a wide for a wide receiver to win the Heisman. Excuse me. So today we have a, a bit of a different topic set, kind of kind of themed actually, uh, modeled towards CBS. Um, the, I guess, sort of college football broadcasting giant. I wouldn't say it's a giant, you know, with only one conference of, uh, of uh, partnerships. But, um, Marshall, I'm going to start off with a question. So, uh, 1996 Tennessee-Memphis game, uh, what, what was so special about it? Omar, I think, I think you're going to have to be the one to tell me that. So, other than Memphis beating a ninth-ranked Tennessee team at the Liberty Bowl, the game was broadcast nationally on CBS – and it's notable because that was a Conference USA-controlled game. So um, I've done some research in the past. I mean, I'm a huge nerd for um, college sports broadcasting, especially college football. And uh, I've stumbled upon these, um, these sort of lists um, that lists every announcer pairing on network TV for college football from 1990 until I think uh, 2004, 2005. And it's, it's really amazing. And I have like done my research with some of these lists, and they're, they're incredibly accurate. You wouldn't think it is. They're, uh, they're links that are in a Google Groups forum, and um, somehow they're really accurate. And I, fo I found um, in the years 1996 and 1997 that CBS, for some reason, started broadcasting Conference USA games, and I've not been able to find any rationale why on the web, even though I've, I've sort of come up with um, some, I guess, reasons in my head, like why they might have done that. I guess the main one being um, that Army was joining the conference in 1998, which, I mean, they weren't in the league when they were broadcasting games. But uh, Army was joined the league in 1998. And, of course, Army Navy's been on CBS since 1996. So, and uh, among these games are broadcast. You can find a couple of them online. I, I know Tennessee Memphis has been posted on YouTube uh, recently, as well as uh, Louisville, Illinois. Oddly enough, they chose that game, even though Illinois hadn't been relevant in a good few years. And um, the third one that they broadcasted, they actually broadcasted Louisville back-to-back -back weeks in 1997. So they only chose one game in 96, Tennessee Memphis, but in 97, they broadcasted two straight Louisville games. The first one being Louisville, Illinois, and the second one being Louisville versus number one ranked Penn State. And Penn State jumped out to a 50-14 lead at halftime. So, I mean, that went about as well as it did. So in this time, I guess during, uh, during COVID-19, I've come up with a, sort of a revised and extended Cuse on CBS list. And uh, I want to know your thoughts on some of these games, Marshall, that um, I guess I, I sort of found and dug through these cruise controlled games. So uh, starting yeah. um, there weren't really any noteworthy games opening weekend, and uh, that's pretty unfortunate because CBS doesn't really broadcast games opening weekend. I mean, it's pretty rare because the SEC does their thing non-conference-wise, and then Alabama has their neutral side games, which are always on ABC. But the next week, we have um, UK at Cincinnati looking like the best candidate for a um, – Actually, sorry, my mistake. Um, I think actually in 96, there was first week Memphis at – or Miami at Memphis. So this is the mid-90s. Uh, mm -hmm. University of Miami, still popular. Um, and there's no game on CBS that whole day. So it could control the 330 slot. And um, going up against in that time slot on ABC in particular, we have number 12 Michigan against Illinois, a 20-8 game Michigan win. We have Colorado versus Washington State. Colorado ranked number fifth. They won that one 37-19. Uh, we have Texas Tech at Kansas State. Uh, I think Kansas State was ranked pretty high then. That was a 21-14 Kansas State win. And then lastly, we have Clemson at UNC, 45-0 UNC. Uh, the the Memphis-Miami game ended with 30-7 win for Miami. So uh, how do you think the Memphis game would have stacked up that week? You know, I think it probably, probably wouldn't have stacked up too well in all reality. I think – you know, I, I think there's just a lot of competition with some top-ranked players there. You know, it's like you got Michigan, you got Colorado. And, I mean, you got Tennessee to bring it in. Like, not to say that the game I – guess, I guess – let me rephrase that. The game, it, it wouldn't have not stacked up well, but I think there's enough other games where it's, it's in hindsight we're like, okay, that was a pretty good game, you know. But going into it, you're like, okay, this is probably – you'd probably give it like a one-third, one-third, one-third split. Like, there's nothing that stands out to me about that game you know, relative to, you know, some of those other games. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I guess keep in mind that uh, the ABC slates used to be very regional. Like, uh, they used to carry huge regional slates, and the only time slot that they'd carry games on was the 330 slot. So, and um, I, think, I think also, too, something to factor in is the Miami market. 
which I don't think any of these games really appeal to the Miami market or and the Memphis market too, for that matter, because I mean, of course, 96 is the first year of SEC on CBS and um, probably the closest game to appeal to anyone in that area is Clemson UNC. But again, it's the ACC in the nineties one and it's not Florida state. So I, I think, honestly, I think that game could stack pretty well in those markets alone as in terms of national exposure. I don't think so because I mean Miami's on a bit of their decline. Um, after I think their coach at the moment is Butch Davis. I'm not sure, but uh, they're on a bit of a decline uh, from their peak in the late '80s, early '90s. But it's still Miami. It's still the U. It's not. They're not a joke like they are today. Um, so that's my view on that game. The next week we have it was kind of a lighter slate. So we have a uh, Kentucky at Cincinnati at um at Nippert Stadium, who Pat McAfee has called the Wrigley Field of college football. I think that's it. <laughs> but um, that one ended up with a 24-3 Cincinnati win. Good win for the conference there. And then stacking up that week uh, were Illinois-USC, a ranked USC team, uh, 55-3 to USC win. Louisville-Penn State, and keep in mind all regional games, Penn, uh, Penn State 24-7 win. TCU-Oklahoma. TCU out of the whack, and Oklahoma struggling in the mid-90s. So that one, like, it, it has brand name appeal, but Oklahoma has been relevant in the past couple of years. 20-7, to 7, TCU win. And then Georgia Tech, North Carolina State, 28-16, North Carolina State win. So how do you think that game would stack up? The U- I think that's a little bit – I think that's a little bit more favorable, for sure. I think, you know, there's a – there are some other, you know, brand name teams, but it seems like it's a more hindsight brand name. You know, like, I'm thinking, like – TCU, right? It's like they're not, they're not, you know, like you said, they're struggling at the time. Um, I don't know. It's like, it seems to me that it's the two strongest mid name brands kind of in the week stacking up on each other. Yeah. Whereas there's no like high low matchup, you know, it's like there's not two like top teams in that slate, at least, you know. I, I think it stacks up pretty favorably. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I mean, and also, too, another thing to keep in mind is um, that game would have been the lead into to, uh, CBS's primetime game that week, Tennessee, mm-hmm. and in Tennessee against UCLA. So you never know, could get some eyes before that game, like uh, after your life, especially in the uh, L.A. markets and the Chicago market. I mean, watching the USC-Illinois game 55-3, to like, I mean, not even, not even close, not a fun game at all. Um, so moving on to the next week, we have uh, Louisville versus Baylor or Baylor at Louisville, I should say, a 14-13 to 13, a, um, Louis- Baylor win, my mistake, Baylor win, that uh, actually ended in the final seconds with, with uh, Louisville's kicker trying to kick a 65-yard field goal. The highlights are on, um, on YouTube. I can send – I can put a link to this amazing channel. It puts, like, pretty much a college football final highlights from the 90s on, for every week. It's pretty amazing. But Louisville lost that one losing, uh, on a 65-yard uh, missed field goal. Stacking it with that one, it's a tougher week because you have Colorado, Michigan at Colorado with uh, Michigan. I and mean, keep in mind, this is like a couple years after Cordell Stewart's famed Hail Mary. So, I mean, like it, it's still a good non-conference matchup. Number 14, BYU at Washington, the West Coast. Uh, 29-17 Washington win. This BYU team would go on to go to the Cotton Bowl, the uh, first WAC team to do so, and only for that matter. Then uh, we have Iowa and Iowa State. Number 21, Iowa wins 38-13. And then, lastly, we have North, uh, Northwestern and Duke. An odd one right there. Because, I mean, Northwestern is still relevant in their a little stretch where they went to the Rose Bowl and the Citrus Bowl in two straight years. But uh, they blew out Duke 38-13. So, how do you think Louisville-Baylor stacks up uh, against those games? I would say regionally, it probably stacks up pretty well, honestly. I think capturing that, that southern market, I think, especially with um, the competition there on the, on the southeast being – you know, Northwestern Duke, most likely. It's like, I think they can definitely take that take that market share right there. I don't really see them taking that West Coast market. You know, BYU-Washington, yeah. that's pretty good. Um, and then I think regionally. Regionally, I'll give them, I'll give them the, the thumbs up there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be like a national telecast on CBS, but um, it, I think that slate was mostly like a one co- – like most of the country gets like the really good game. Michigan, mm-hmm. Colorado, and the rest get this, gets, like, the scraps. And there were some good games, but, like, Iowa-Iowa State doesn't really have national appeal. Like, it's more of a regional rivalry. Same with, like, BYU-Washington. Of course, like, mm-hmm. been West Coast bias on that front. So, that, I mean, there's there is another option as well. Uh, this one, I think, could get pretty interesting, um, in my opinion, right here. We have September 21st, USC at Houston in the Astrodome. And this USC team was ranked coming off a Rose Bowl berth. 
So you have a brand name there, and then pitting it against. You have options here, to say the least. Okay. Um, pitting it, you would pit it against uh, either number nine Notre Dame and number six Texas at noon. Um, and I mean that's a tough one there. That one was a good game. It was a twenty-seven twenty-four Notre Dame win. They went on a field goal. Or you have the three thirty window, which is a lot of lackluster games that week. You have um, number eight Michigan uh, against BC twenty fourteen Michigan Michigan win. Georgia Tech, North Carolina, 16-0 North Carolina win. North Carolina is ranked number 11. And then um, another option that exists is uh, moving the or moving the Florida-Tennessee game to primetime and airing the uh, USC-Houston game with those um, regional ABC games. So what, what are your thoughts on that one? Because, I mean, you have USC, a brand name still in the 90s and to this day, and, and uh, sure. that's rarely broadcast USC games. I think, like, the – there's been only two since uh, they switched to the um, SEC on CBS, with, uh, with it being 2003, Auburn, USC, and then the 2012 Sun Bowl. So what are, what are your thoughts on, on sort of that week's Houston on CBS game? Man, I, th- I think you hit the nail on the head. They have the USC drawn there, but that's just some stiff competition. Yeah. I, I'd say, you know, in that, in that Houston market, I'm sure that those people are going to love that game, right, in the Texas market probably. But – or, I mean, even at that, you got Texas and Notre Dame. Totally yeah, exactly. that. It's like, exactly. yeah, that's just, that's a tough slate to go against. I don't know if you can compete with that. Yeah, it's odd because, I mean, back then, Florida, Tennessee, like, that was a 3.30 game. I mean, you could easily move out to primetime. That, that's like our equivalent of, the 90s equivalent of LSU, Alabama. Like, every yeah. year, like, within division. Like, those two teams are the top teams. Like, I don't see why you wouldn't move out to primetime, but. I mean, the noon slot, it's only, like, one national game to compete with, but it's, it's a big national game, to say the least. So, there, to round out the schedule, um, you have – this one is a pretty good one for the conference. Again, Houston at the Astrodome, but hosting number nine, North Carolina. And that game, they would ultimately, ultimately lose 42-14. to And I forgot to say the score of the USC-Houston game, which was a 29 SC win. But uh, going up against that one, so it's a, it's a funny situation here because – for those of you that don't know, in the mid '90s to 2000, uh, CBS also broadcasted Big East games as well. So you can have a, a Big East game regional, regionally paired with a SEC game, or it's a noon Big East game with a 3:30 SEC game. So the noon Big East game was Syracuse Boston College, which a game that doesn't have much appeal outside the Northeast. Honestly, as like the brand name power isn't there for the Eastern programs to this day, but pitting it against um, the other, the 330 games, which you could do, or uh, which you could do regionally, um, would be number eight, Colorado, Texas, a 28-24 win for the Buffaloes. Number 24, UVA versus uh, FSU, 31-24 win for Florida State. Number two, Ohio State versus number 20, Iowa, 38-26, Ohio State. And then number four, Arizona State, Stanford. I know you might be biased towards that one, Marshall, but uh, 49, 41-9 win against uh, Arizona State. So, this looks like murderer's row for this game to compete, even if they're number nine ranked team, UNC, playing in it. So what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you said it. It's Those are some great matchups. You know, in conference, top teams. Like, there's no getting around it. And at this point, if I'm a viewer, I'm thinking back to the past weeks where you, you're watching some Houston teams just get waxed. Yeah, it's like, good on top of that, it's like you're you're looking at this game. You're like Houston, man. They, you know, you may love them to death, but they're just they're just not in the same league, right? Yeah. At this time, and and so it's like you, in hindsight and in foresight, I think you would say Houston's going to get waxed. Yeah, exactly. Good point there. Yeah. So I mean, and it's not like there like, there's like marquee games, but those games are like very competitive and like high scoring and like uh, nationally relevant too, for that matter. Especially like Arizona State with a chance to win the national title going to the. Mm-hmm. Bowl. Like, very nationally relevant game on the West Coast there. So that rounds out the 96 Qs on CBS schedule. We move on to 97. It's a bit lighter because, I mean, like, Louisville hogged up the windows in uh, weeks uh, three and four. Yeah, three and four uh, uh, against uh, Illinois and Penn State. So um, to start off the year, you'd have um, Cal at Houston again, again, with the Houston market, but this time playing a Cal team that played in the Aloha Bowl the year before. So they're pretty, they're pretty talented. There's some high hope out in Berkeley. I mean, you pit that game against um, number three, Tennessee, against UCLA on ABC at the Rose Bowl. Number four, Washington, against number 16, BYU. Uh, 42-20 win for the Huskies. Penn State pit, uh, I mean, a great rivalry still in the 90s 
with Penn State number two, beating Pitt 34-17. Syracuse, Oklahoma. Oklahoma is still in a funk, but um, Syracuse kind of getting that New York market, and it, it was an exciting game. Uh, decided on a missed field goal, 36-34 win for Oklahoma. And number 24, Northwestern against Wake Forest uh, to sort of like round out the Chicago and, uh, I guess, Charlotte markets with a 27-20 upset at Wake Forest over Northwestern. So uh, how do you think that Cal-Houston game stacks up that week? I think that's pretty favorable. You know, I th- there's nothing that stands out to me as it's going to be like, you know, a, a game change, like a, a national, like, this is going to change the slate of the rankings. Like, you know, there's no one versus two. There's no, like, top ten matchup. Like, the brands that are playing are all good, but I think it's like, like you said, like, Cal can compete on a brand level somewhat. I think Houston can also compete on that brand level. I think, it, you know, if you're, in, if you're in Houston, you're in Berkeley as well as, like, some other places. I think you might give that a shot. Yeah, I mean, you have, like, the San Francisco market, too, with Berkeley. But um, I guess, like, for me, I'm kind of skeptical for that one because you have great rivalries. You have a great rivalry on the regional slate for, like, the eastern market, Penn State Pitt. You got sure. a great matchup, you know, uh, Washington versus BYU. BYU coming off the 14-1 and season going to the Cotton Bowl the year before. Mm-hmm. You have Tennessee-UCLA who played on primetime the year before. So I'm a bit skeptical, and like you said – I guess the viewers, if they remember last year, if they would have showed these Houston games, it might be wary of the Houston Cougars hogging up the, the CBS slots on a, for Conference USA. So I'm a bit skeptical, and, and Houston would lose that one 35-3 to Cal. So. Oh, okay. Well, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a bit there. Yeah, I, I should have said the score. But, um, and then after the Louisville games, you don't get – I don't think you'd get another slot until November 15th, 1997, and you have Ole Miss visiting, visiting the Superdome, Tulane, the big New Orleans market there. Ole Miss on their way to a Music City Bowl appearance. And I think they beat Marshall in that game. But um, there was no noon game for CBS. And there was a 3.30 game. I forgot who it was. But um, that could be a lead-in. No noon competition for ABC right there. So you'd have the slot all to yourself on network TV for a 41-24 Ole Miss win. But um, you think that's great exposure for the league, even if Tulane loses? Man, I mean, I guess it's like any publicity is good publicity, right? Yeah. Like the- getting on TV, get, just having people know your name is probably a benefit, really. I mean, yeah. it'd be probably, I mean, I, I would say objectively, it'd probably be worse if you just weren't on TV and people didn't know who you were. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, and it is New Orleans, a huge market, too. Um, plus, like, it's it's not, I don't think it's too bad. I mean, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at a game recap of that one, but um, it's only 41 24 game, kind of high scoring. You know, Tulane might have been into it late in the game before Ole Miss pulled away. I mean, plus, it also promotes CBS's. SEC products. I, I don't see why they wouldn't do it, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. So, I mean, that rounds out pretty much the games that I have listed for, I guess, the sort of revised CUSA on CBS schedule for 96 and 97. I guess doing a little bit of revisionist history, like, what do you think this does for the conference if, like, CBS goes through this two-year trial of, like, carrying certain CUSA games? You know, I'll fall back again. I think just getting the names out there is a benefit. Like, especially at this time where we don't have as much, like, technology everywhere. You don't have access to the informa- same information we do nowadays. Like, nowadays we can go online and look up, you know, who's, who, who all the conferences are, who's in the conferences, what's the result of the games, who are the players on these teams. It's like back then, the only, the only time you're really seeing it, maybe if you're digging through a newspaper and for some reason they have the, the roster on there of Tulane, you know, but otherwise it's like you're, you're just getting your information from watching them on, on TV, on ESPN, ABC, CBS. So – Without it, I would say it's a just object like again objectively worse. Like like if you have it or you don't have it, it's much better to have it. Yeah, I totally agree. And like I think like looking into the next year, nineteen ninety eight, um, like you look at Army joining the conference. Of course, like probably the biggest brand that Conference USA has at that time, with it being a service academy. Um, and then the next year, I mean, of course, ninety eight, you have Tulane going twelve and zero. And you have, like, games there that I guess are sort of attractive. Like, they played Navy at home. Of course, Navy being a brand, which we'll talk about later, Navy's relationship with CBS. But um, they play Navy at home, and they also play Army in a late not con- in a late um, in-conference game at Mikey Stadium. So, I mean, you have, like, two keystone games, right? like, key games right there for uh, conference. And then you also have uh, – Tulane also played a game on Thanksgiving that day. So, maybe, like, you open up a Black Friday spot to see if Tulane ends their season perfect. Like – I mean, the possibilities are there. I feel like they ended it a year too soon uh, <laughs> with that Tulane hat, with Tulane going in and, like, Army coming also as well. So, I mean, you, you just never know. Um, I think it's too I think it's too far to tell whether they'd have the mass exodus that they'd have. Well, not really mass, but, like, 
whether they'd be affected by a conference realignment like they were in 04 and even harder in like 2012 and 2013. Um, I think it's too far to tell that, but I think you plant that seed, you never know like where it's going to grow in terms of uh, the relationship with the network. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, moving on, we, I know I talked about Navy there a little bit. So this, I, I feel like this is like two years late to talk about. <laughs> So 2018 was the last uh, Notre Dame Navy game, Navy controlled game. So meaning a Navy home game, even though they've never played at Annapolis, they've never played the Notre Dame Navy game at Annapolis, but uh, the first Navy home game or the the last Navy home game broadcasted by CBS against Notre Dame. Um, This year would have been the first one against uh, in Ireland and back to Annapolis would have been the first one not broadcasted by CBS since uh, 1994, I believe. Yeah. 1994. Um, and I think, honestly, I think the Notre Dame Navy uh, contract with CBS where Navy controlled games were broadcasted by the network was one of the most underrated and like um, interesting TV contract deals, I think, in recent memory, because you have, you have Navy, I mean, you have Navy as an independent at first signing on to have like uh, their one, they're pretty much aside from Army, Navy and our Navy Air Force, their one um, pretty much nationally high profile game broadcasted on a network. So they had that exposure that a lot of mid-majors didn't have at the time um, from the 90s all the way up to the 2010s um, every other year. And plus, like, it was like one of those games that you associated with the network. Like, it's hard, it's hard to see that nowadays. Like, for a long time, you had Ohio State, Michigan on ABC, but now that Fox has jumped in, it's kind of jumbled, like, every other year. And then you have, I mean, sort of like Florida, Georgia on CBS and the Sun Bowl on CBS. I guess you see a theme here, Army-Navy on CBS – CBS has those like identifiable games. So, um, Marshall, I guess I guess what were your thoughts on, on the deal with uh, Notre Dame Navy being broadcasted every other year on CBS? I think it's ahead of its time. You know, it's like I think when we think about you know team specific deals, what comes to mind for me, Longhorn Network. <laughs> Ob- <laughs> you know, obviously, obviously, you know, in hindsight, one of the greater failures of network TV as a person. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think it makes a whole lot of sense, really. And I think on a game by game basis, if you can get these recurring series, like obviously, you know, within conference, you're going to have your conference matchups every year. But even those, I think it could be it could make sense to kind of have their own individual contracts. I mean, that's probably why you know these these uh, these TV contracts they like to line it up for what 10, 12 years at a time. Like it's like yeah, you look at it and it seems like a lot of money, but you spread it out over ten years among ten teams, and it's like I mean, it's still a lot of money, right? But I think, you know, in the team's interest, they could probably, you know, capitalize on their own merits if they're able to. Like, if, like, if you're a middling, like, for instance, in that Tulane team, right? Like, the year before, you know, you're, you're just not competitive. You're afterwards, you go 12-0. and 0. You might want to re-up your contracts next year. You know, you probably bring in a little bit more money. Like, I, I mean, sure, it, it might hurt, I guess, on the, on the back end, some of those teams that aren't as well off. But I can see an instance in which this could be a attractive contract negotiation opportunity for teams, perhaps on a year to year, maybe a few multi-year deals. I I think it can make a lot of sense, really. Yeah, I think the great thing about it, or um, pretty much the thing that's like really amazing about is um, how the deal with CBS for the Notre Dame games, it lasted through maybe joining the American like CBS still had the game. Of course, the American had their own contract, but CBS still, or Navy still had that game against Notre Dame whenever they were the home team with CBS, despite being in the American. And I think it's so amazing that a deal crafted in the mid '90s could last that long and through so much change in college football. Like it was really like a mainstay too. And I think too, like um, they brought some great exposure to some, I guess, like not so worthy teams. And I'm not, I'm not saying that as a cadet from a biased standpoint. Like some of the Navy teams they put on CBS. They, they just, they weren't good. Like you take a night, the 1998 team that was three and eight playing Notre Dame. They only beat a winless Kent state team Colgate and a mediocre Boston college team. It was even worse in 2000 when you have a one in 10 Navy team whose only win came against army granted a win, win army team, but we're not going to talk about that. But I mean, they, they were one in 10 and they played a national TV game at 12 o'clock against Notre Dame. And then you go to, I mean, you also look back at the 98 game it was a regional telecast. Another regional game was highly significant to the national t- title picture. It was a Tennessee, Arkansas game with the Sterner stumble. So to think that CBS deemed Notre Dame Navy uh, with, you know, all its glory, all its history as a rivalry as worthy of taking, of, of taking a national TV slot 
from a nationally relevant game pretty much that decided like the national title for that matter, I think. I mean, I think it's truly amazing. I mean, just the respect and the honor that they gave to the Notre Dame Navy rivalry too. Yeah, I agree. I think that's why it's like, again, in, in that instance, it's in Navy's best interest to have that contract set up. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, uh, and I, I mean, I'm sad it's coming to an end. Like, I'm a purist. I love seeing the games on, on CBS. I mean, that was like, that's one of the, that's one of, that's pretty much the only Navy game that I enjoy watching. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like, I mean, it was great too. And plus, it also gave them primetime network appearances. And like, if you look at the numbers, like uh, 2014, it was um, the first primetime game uh, in the series since 1986. And it did pretty well ratings wise. Looking at the ratings right now, and you have, um, let's see. Yeah, that game actually beat out Stanford, Oregon. Fox is a primetime game, ratings-wise. It got a 2.3 rating to Stanford, Oregon's 1.5, and Oregon went to the playoff that year. And it was a, um, it was a, ta- and it actually out, it actually outdrew the um, t- uh, television-wise the regional pairing of Illinois, Ohio State, and Oklahoma State, Kansas State on Saturday Night Football. So I mean, that was the highest-rated primetime game, Notre Dame Navy, partly put, partly because like Notre Dame was a, uh, you know, highly ranked at the time before they had their breakdown in 2014, but. Also because Navy made a game of it. And then again, in primetime in 2018, they um, had the game, which, I mean, it wasn't as competitive, but it wasn't like a horrible blowout. I mean, mm-hmm. like the rating for the Texas-Oklahoma State primetime game that night was a 2.1, and the Notre Dame-Navy was a 1.5. And I mean, you take into effect Navy being 3-10. and 10. I mean, of course, Notre Dame being a playoff team that year did pr- probably help the ratings a bit, but the exposure was there for, for them. So um, I guess I pose this question now too, like, I mean, will we ever see anything like it where, like, uh, one game like that gets, like, a sort of, like, special deal, like, special handshake deal with the network? I 100% think we will. I think I'll touch on it more on our next topic. But I was reading a little bit about, you know, murmurs of a certain of a certain conference looking to do a streaming deal as opposed to a traditional TV deal. And so I think it totally makes sense for, now, for streaming services to go on a game. I mean, we've already seen it a little bit in the NFL. You know, we've seen some games stream on Facebook and Twitter. I think that makes so much sense, especially with the proliferation of how we absorb our media these days. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's really on a on a more, like, you know, streaming service-based. Um, you know, you're, like, watching Netflix, you're watching Hulu, you're not. You don't, people don't find themselves as much watching anymore. AB, ABC, CBS, you know. Yeah. Like, as much as we hate to say it, I think the future is kind of away from the network. So I think it totally makes sense on a streaming service to kind of play on a game-by-game basis. Okay, yeah, I, I, I think that's a great point. I didn't think about that, honestly, because I'm on the other side. I think we'll never see anything like that again, at least for the networks, maybe for the streaming. Like, we'll see, because I know, like, sure. you know, Prime or whatever has their th- Thursday night package. But, like, I mean, that's sort of like a selection of games. Like, um, I don't think we'll see it again on the networks or in general, because, like, if you look at the scenarios, I, I think, like, the number one um, beneficiaries or um, probably, like, yeah, beneficiaries of um, a deal like this are the independents. And Navy's an organ and independent, of course, and the American. But you have Army, UMass, New Mexico State, and maybe Liberty. Like you have schools like that that are independents, and um, none of them play a big opponent regularly enough to sort of have a network pick out like, hey, like we want this, say Army Notre Dame game for CBS when Army's a home team, and like UMass too. Same thing with UMass. Like UMass isn't going to sniff like a big opponent, like. Right now, their streaming deal for football is with Flow Sports, which is, like, I've heard a bad streaming service and it's, like, really obscure. I mean, I can see a network trying to, like, buy them out so they can host a game um, of relevance, but UMass doesn't really have those games. It's the same thing with Mexico State. Like, they don't have those games of, like, national relevance that a network would be like, all right, if we pay out this network, uh, this streaming service, like, you know, we could pretty much, you know, make big here, make, make good, good money here. So, I mean, I don't think we'll see it again just because the regularity – of the uh, Notre Dame Navy rivalry where it's like you have one national brand and you have another brand that's not as big comparatively. So a network can cash in. So, I mean, I think, I think that's like the last that we've seen of like sort of the, um, I guess like, you know, game by game, like one game is associated to this network type of deal. Sure. Well, Omar, let me pose you this. Do you think someone from New Mexico would rather watch, you know, UNM or New Mexico state play a conference opponent or do you think they'd rather watch, you know, their local kind of what, whatever game they get on their on their uh, CBS, you know, like say it was like an Illinois-Ohio State game, right? Yeah. Like I would argue that it, it would make a lot of sense for them. To, so sure, like a streaming service I think would be more capable of doing this because they can, you know, handle probably a lower cost and then 
pay for each game like what it's worth necessarily right because it's like obviously that unm game isn't going to get much exposure outside of new mexico right yeah but i think it can make sense for that streaming service to buy the rights to to distribute that game and then distribute it in new mexico and they could do it on a per re- like a pure like a region basis like it's not going to be like a southwest region it's not going to be a houston based region you know it's going to be a a true like these are the people that like this this is where we're going to distribute the content I mean, I can see that for sure. Like, I think you, you're sort of like delving into like um, what the NFL Network used to do. And I think uh, when Monday Night Football moved to ESPN, how I guess local stations used to air those games on their um, like sort of like your local ABC for against those fans that didn't have cable. So, I mean, I can totally see that happening. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense for like, I guess, like a network like buying out that game. But um, then again, I guess like, um, you know, with when it comes to conference contracts, like when you have like a rivalry like um, New Mexico State, New Mexico and like UTEP, New Mexico State, like, um, you know, I guess would that streaming service, I guess, or would that network want to let go of that inventory, you know? Because, I mean, you can like air that on like ESPN Plus or like a smaller network and it still trumps any um, regular old conference game that week that um, any uh, any of the other like conference teams are playing too. So, I mean, it comes to a matter of being willing to let go of that inventory, I think, with that situation you pose. Sure. Well, let's let that segue into the next topic. Okay, yeah. So next topic, um, continuing on the CBS and I guess finishing too with our last topic. So for those of you that don't know, 2023, um, the SEC on CBS will be no more. The CBS completely lowballed the SEC in terms of um, the, the next TV contract. So the SEC is searching for a new partner and CBS for that matter. They'll have um, inventory in the Mountain West. I know um, in the first couple of years in the Mountain West deal, they'll have a couple of games a year on CBS. But it's pretty barren for CBS, too, like as of now, because I don't see no matter when the Big Ten uh, contract ends, I don't see them leaving Fox since Fox pretty much runs the Big Ten network. Um, Big 12, maybe, but I don't think the Big 12 leaves ESPN either. So CBS is in kind of a rut. But then again, that brings in the Pac-12, who has been notably lagging behind the rest of the Power Five. So could you see some, some sort of marriage between the Pac-12 and the CBS, Marshall? I, I honestly don't think I could. I'm going to have to go back to my, my earlier point. So I was reading about, you know, the, the negotiations for the Pac-12 for their next TV contract and obviously ending in 2024, so a few years out still. But, you know, considering how, sure, when they signed their first contract, what, 10, you know, whatever years ago, uh, it was like the largest contract at the time, right? But then every other conference came up with a bigger mega deal. And so it's like, I think the Pac-12 this time around, they're going to look and say, all right, well, where's – what can we do to best maximize? Because say we're not going to get the biggest TV contract, you know, we don't have the biggest teams. Like they have big teams. Don't get me wrong. There's some big brands, but I think they're going to have to do kind of a hybrid. They're going to have to look and see where is the future. Right. And so I was reading that there have been contract talks between especially the PAC 12 and Apple, right. To stream on their streaming service potentially. But then there have also been, they have confirmed that there have also been talks between the PAC 12 and um, Amazon and the PAC 12 and Netflix. And I think, that just makes so much sense. Like if we think about, you know, like I mentioned earlier, where are people going to be consuming their media from, right? It's no longer going to be on cable networks. I know both my parents have already cut their cable package. I don't have a cable package, right? I think that's going to be the future, right? Everyone's going to be streaming on Netflix. They're going to be streaming on Hulu. They're going to be streaming on Amazon. And so I think in order to get ahead of the curve, they're going to best, they're going to try to, they're going to have to try to position themselves. They're either going to have to try to position themselves for the future or they're going to fall behind. Right. I think this is very much uh, like if you look back, it's an NFL example. Right. But if you think about the Cowboys, right, they really kind of started. I remember reading. So back in, I don't know, whenever Jerry Jones bought the team. Right. The NFL started asking teams, hey, who wants to play on Thanksgiving? And every team said, no way we're going to play on Thanksgiving that, you know, everyone's with their families. No way. Jerry Jones raised his hand and said, I'll do it, right? And this was one of the turning points of really the Cowboys becoming a huge brand. If you can put yourself out there in front of viewers, it's going to be good regardless. Like, no matter if your team's getting blown, blown out, thinking back to that, you know, that CUSA back in 96, 97, even if your team's getting blown out, getting eyeballs on you is going to be a good thing, right? So Pac-12, I think in order to get those eyeballs, they're going to have to position themselves ahead of the curve, and they're going to have to get out in front of this. They're going to have to be on a streaming service. And I think especially they're going to have to consider uh, and from CBS. So from, sorry, CBS is going to have to consider um, that as well, because if they're looking at their competitors, right, looking at ABC, for instance, right, who's ABC owned by? They're owned by Disney. 
what else does Disney own? They own Hulu. Okay, oh, wow. so yeah. so ABC might already have a little bit of a streaming advantage. So CBS, they're either going to have to, they might have to establish a little, like I think they have a streaming service, but they're going to have to really proliferate this thing. So I think the Pac-12, they're going to move to a streaming service. And if the CBS, and if CBS doesn't act quick, I think they could be gone out of everything. Oh, um, yeah, that, that's that's a good point. Like, I mean, for me, I can't imagine CBS being out, but I like the hybrid model that you bring the, the hybrid model that you bring up. So, I guess sort of proposal here is say you have like that sort of Pac-12 game of the week on CBS three thirty, and then you have like the sort of like you know lower games, like you have your um, Colorado versus uh, uh, Utah game or Colorado Colorado versus Cal games on Netflix because like I feel like there's still sort of the perception that if you're on a uh, streaming service that is not ESPN Plus or any of the others, it's kind of Bush League. Like, in the past, the only thing I've heard was, um, I think the American was putting, like, women's basketball on Amazon Prime. And, it like, the response was, like, it was, like, Bush League. And it's, like, through no fault, fault of either party. So I think if, like, you, I think you got to start by not putting the biggest games on the streaming services, but, like, you got to put your toe in and, like, put, like, your, um, your sort of, like, less desired inventory on there first, see the reception, but still that game of the week. Cause like, I think the Pac-12 could be in a lucrative spot here for the CBS. Like you look, I think the first thing you look at is like programs or brands. You have USC, of course, UCLA, LA market there too. And then Oregon as well. I mean, Oregon's is still a pretty big band <clears throat> brand in my opinion. Um, and then as well, after that, you look at like rivalry inventory, you have the civil war, you have the game, you have the territorial cup, you have um, USC, UCLA, the crosstown rivalry. Then you have pretty much every year, USC and Stanford play Notre Dame. You have a Notre Dame game to your inventory every single year if the Pac-12 adds CBS with a game of the week format. So I think CBS, like, that could be, like, it, it could be a match made in heaven, in my opinion. You have a lagging Power 5 conference, and then you have a TV, you have a TV giant that's about to see its way out of college football if, they're, if they don't act quick. So, and I think that works together perfectly to sort of, like, resurrect both parties, too. Like, and this is a similar situation to the 80s. You look back um, – the College Football Association. Well, first you look back to 81, where you have the Supreme Court of the U.S. ruling that the NCAA cannot control TV contracts. From that, you have the College Football Association, which is a forerunner of the Power Five. These guys, they partnered up with, uh, it was like the ACC, the, pa- or the ACC, the Big Eight, the Southwest, the WAC, too, and the Service Academies in Notre Dame. They all partnered with, they all partnered together to negotiate TV contracts. And from there, you had all those teams pretty much on ABC. Like, those were the teams that were on ABC. But excusing themselves from the College Football Association, of course, because the Rose Bowl, Big Ten and Pac-10. So who gets the scraps of the Big Ten and the Pac-10? CBS does. So it's a similar situation there where CBS is left in the cold and, you know, they have this conference to choose from. It's like not really – it's kind of the scraps, but it's not really the scraps. Like it's, it's, you know, I guess it's like the scraps of caviar for that matter. So sure. I, think this, I think CBS could hop on that. But the hybrid model, like to be ahead of the time on that, like that, that's definite. I totally agree with that. I, I'll take it one step further. I really think, you know, you said you might want to put your less desired inventory out there. I think you put the biggest names out there, Okay. honestly. Like, let's, let's think about it like this. If you have, you know, an Oregon, an Oregon State matchup, right? You're playing the Civil War. If you're in Oregon, you're going to watch that game, right? Yeah. I don't care where it's streamed from. Like, if it's on Netflix, guess what? Everybody already has Netflix, right? That'll work out perfectly. Like, it's not like, like, sure, people are going to call it, you know, whatever games are streaming is Bush League. But let's think about why they're doing that. Who's calling it that? In my opinion, I think it's more of these old heads, right? They're afraid to change, you yeah. know, which is weird to me because they all already have Netflix. They already have Hulu. Everyone's already doing streaming. Like, it makes no sense to me why people are afraid of college football moving off of networks. You'll get the same guys commentating it. You, you still have, like, big names like ESPN+. Plus. They have a streaming service, right? I mean, let's look at, like, the UFC. Let's look at boxing, for instance, right? Boxing especially. They've already established their own streaming network just for, like, their big games. It's, like, to me, it makes it makes just perfect sense. And, and in terms of lucrativeness, right? Sure, I think CBS, they could, you know, because in a last-ditch effort to try and save themselves, they could offer the Pac-12 some kind of insane deal. But even at that it might be horrible for the Pac-12 because then they're locked into something for 10 years when everyone else might move to streaming right after that, right? And then you're left in an even worse position. Sure, you have a little bit of money, but everyone's already won, re-upped your deal. They're already making more money anyways, right, after after they renew. And then two, they're going to be moving to where the future moves. Like, in my opinion, we're thinking 2024, right? If we're in 2020 right now, people are already moving to streaming services in such a high volume. 
there is no doubt in my mind by 2024, it will have exponentially increased. Like, I think they need to really get ahead of this one and just put themselves on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree. Like, I mean, I guess a short-term contract is good, but I think the future, like, from what all we've seen, is, like, long-term deals in terms of media because, like, everyone wants to secure their membership, especially, like, especially now after, like, COVID-19. Like, those are the conference landscapes going to look at. Like, like, you want to sign that grant of rights where, like, it pretty much locks people in revenue-wise to your conference, too. So, I mean, the short-term contract seems good to stay on top of the trends, but in a world that's so unstable, especially after this pandemic, like, I know that's the way to go. But with that being said, with your point on, like, people are going to watch no matter what, I, I agree with that. And I bring up an example from um, this past year with um, BYU versus UMass, where, like, you had uh, the UMass game on, um, on Flow Sports this year. The previous year was on 11 Sports, like, two, like, really obscure, like, like networks and then like last year in 2018 the umass byu game which i was able to attend at gillette but um the the uh, the byu byu tv was able to sort of like work out a deal with nesson to um uh, or with 11 sports slash nesson the regional carrier of like you know new england sports um they're sort of able to work out a deal to like get that game on byu tv to save them from like having to buy a, like an extra cable package with that channel they weren't that fortunate this year because I guess it was sort of a different partner, Flow Sports, being an online exclusive streamer only. They weren't able to get that game. Like BYU TV wasn't able to get to work that out. So it brought more business to Flow Sports. But um, again, like you're going to watch your team, like no matter what platform they are. And like within reason too, of course, like, I'm not saying like you're going to buy 190, get locked into a cable content for 190 bucks just to watch your team. But like, if it's just like, all right, you know, a Netflix subscribe, like subscription, like, okay, Netflix is pretty cheap. You know, and it's got other stuff that you might like too. Like, you know, why not do that if your team's on a streaming service? But again, like, um, we'll, we'll just have to see, like, how the next round of negotiations go. Because, like, you sort of see, like, um, who's a trendsetter here? And I think the first, like, really big case study was the American. And the American, they, um, instead of, I guess, going – I mean, they did go more towards streaming with, like, ESPN Plus events. Um, they sort of didn't go the direction that like you're um, intending with like other streaming services. So we'll just have to see who like the next sort of like test cases, whether it be, I guess like the Sunbelt conference USA or others. All I'm saying is if, if it's, if it comes down to like a money issue, right. You know how much money Apple has on their balance sheet? Um, $203 billion. Oh, they can make the Pac-12 a deal that is worth their while. Oh, of course. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, are you talking Apple TV or um... Apple, the corporation? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just saying. Like, I don't know, like, what uh, streaming service, like, they um, they're. Oh, like... right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it would be on their Apple TV kind of service. Okay, I mean, I'm yeah. sure you know, even that service is going to change into the future. Like, everyone, everything is just shifting so rapidly, like, and that too is a reason why I think the Pad 12 might not even want to consider, you know, a long-term deal. Who knows what it's going to look like, you know, every three or four years down the line. I think you got to you gotta position yourself for the future or you're going to fall behind. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, it'll be interesting. Like, it'll be some time before we see, like, what CBS or, or Pac-12 or the Pac-12's moves are. But um, the Pac-12's got to do something quick because, I, I mean, the past, like, nine years, they haven't been able to get their network on direct TV or any relevant, like, cable carrier. So I, I don't know, like, how they're going to, you know, do this. Like, I mean, I want to believe the Pac-12 is going to change, but I, I just can't right now because the lack of, like, forward vision right now. But, I mean, again, we'll see. Hot take. I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. One, I think – okay, I just forgot my first thing. Second take. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think whoever is the first conference, if it's not the SEC, I think the first conference that's able to, you know, get their teams on that position are going to really be able to position themselves to rival the SEC in the future. Because I think I think it's clear it's clear to me at least, you know I think streaming is the future. I think there's more eyeballs there. I think if you get yourself in front of all of America, right, you're going to make your teams have a bigger brand. You're going to be able to attract better recruits down the line, and you're going to be taking them from people like Alabama, like Georgia, like LSU. And then all of a sudden, your team's just got a lot better. Your conference is going to be able to re-up those new contracts for way more money. I think it's just a strong investment in brand. And whoever does it first, they're going to have that big 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 first mover advantage i i would agree because something i just thought of the late night tv slot which like it, it's the pac-12 slot they have a slot to themselves but like the uh sort of like audience i guess you know matters most to them is the east coast audience and like they're not staying up unless they're a super fan to like watch these games that are like late 
getting on those streaming services, there's not really any congestion. Like, they can have any TV slot they want. So, I mean, I totally agree with that, I guess, in terms of the Pac-12. Like, it'll put them in position to, like, better compete with SEC. And, like, I mean, again, like, with young fans, too, I mean, the, the future is now. I mean, I totally agree with that. I think about it. Like, your little brother, for instance, right? Like, say he's, he's just browsing Netflix, and he just sees, you know, all this live sports come up. He's going to watch that, right? Yeah. And he's going to be impressionized by those brands. Like, not just your brother, of course, like every, every little kid in America. And then some of those little kids are going to grow up to be five-star recruits. And those five-star recruits are going to say, hey, I watched them growing up. They're a big brand to me. I'm going to consider them. And if Alabama's not on that service and they don't know about Alabama as much, sure, they're a big brand, but they're going to they're gonna start getting that incremental edge on those types of programs. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, that's a good point. Like, brands, like, they work, they work good, like, you know, for young folks. Like, Ohio, like my brother's an Ohio State fan. And I, I come back and he's talk, he asked me for an Ohio State jersey. And I think about why I'm like, I can't think of the last time when Ohio State was either not on Fox or ABC. I mean, like, like brands work. I mean, exactly for the recruiting point. Like, like you, you like who you see. Like, I mean, unless you're a kid who like sees a cool logo on NC on the NCAA football video game, which isn't a luxury that we have anymore. Like, we like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm uniform from, from NCA the video game. So again, I think brands are like even bigger. Like TV brands are like even bigger in this day and age. Yeah. I completely agree. Streaming in the future, man. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see. Like, I mean, I, I think, honestly, I think they should be paying you the big bucks, bucks instead of uh, Larry Scott. I mean, like, <laughs> horrible job for the Pac-12. Well, not horrible. I'm sorry. I'm being hard on him. But he's falling behind. He's not doing much. And his solution is you know, putting the conference championship game on a Friday night on ABC, which it's cool. All right. I get I, I like it. It's cool. But, I mean, no one's going to the game. No one's beating San Francisco traffic to go to the – Pac-12 title game and like also it's a hard viewer spot it's, it's a Friday night I mean people are doing other things so I mean we'll, we'll see maybe Pac-12 Commissioner Marshall Stovall is in the, in the future <laughs> but uh I, I would not I would not be opposed to it <laughs> but I, I think it's clear to me you just got to make a bold move because when you do it first it seems clear to me that this is going to be the future right it's going to be a winning move if you do it first you're going to just you're going to reap the rewards it's, it's hard, right? It's hard. It's a hard change. You got to be bold. There's going to be people that say you're dumb, but it, it just seems obvious to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think like the, the first, I guess like the last time that someone's been like a visionary in that fashion. I'm, I'm thinking like maybe the Big 12 network. I mean, not, not the Big 12, the Big 10 network. And then like before that, you had the Mountain West network. People forget the Mountain West was the first to have a conference network. But I mean, like every power conference except for the, the Big 12 has a conference network now. Like, they paved the way. Like, and it seemed crazy at first. Like, people were like, all right, so this is going to be a channel with only your sports? All right, that'll be the day. So, I mean, again, like, it seems crazy at the time, but you got to be crazy to be a visionary. I agree. I agree. All right. Uh, do you have any other topics you want to talk about or anything else to say, Marshall? I think that wraps it up for me, unless you do. Yeah, I, I don't have anything else. Um, thanks for joining us. And a quick note, I will be dropping those links to the um, – sort of like the message board, the Google, the Google groups link with uh, all the announcer pairings. It's, it's really good reading, you know, when you're bored, but um, I'll drop those links and um, also a playlist with, I guess, footage of the Cuse on CBS game. So, you know, that we're not crazy, but um, until next time, we'll see you later. Thanks guys.